Honor to be here with you guys. Please grab your Bibles and go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. As you're turning there, I want to kind of introduce what we're going to be covering. Um, when we come to the idea of church, this is uh, in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians works through the progress of what is the church supposed to be like? What's God's intention for the church? How do we understand our identity being the church? But what I want to do is I want to go to the first reference to church and just kind of lay out some foundation for us. If you guys remember the story where um, Jesus is asking the disciples, now, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets has been raised from the dead. And he said, yeah, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, you know, flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you. My father revealed that to you from heaven. And he said, and upon this rock, you're Peter, and upon this rock, the gates of hell uh, will not prevail against it. And he used the word my church in the middle of that. The word church, ecclesia, is really interesting in that passage specifically because in the day and age of the Roman Empire, when they used the word ecclesia, it meant actually where you had kings or any kind of world leader, they would bring their governing governors to them or the people that they had put in charge to govern so that they could uh, do other things. That's the idea of ecclesia. It actually means these people that I have put in charge they're the church. So when we say the term church, it actually means an assembly of people that have the ability to govern. And when we come to the book of Ephesians specifically, now uh, Paul, the Lord is going to help Paul describe how God wants the church to understand itself. And so if you guys are like I am in the day and age when we say church, we mean it's a place we go. I'm going to go to church. Um, the Bible doesn't use that kind of language. The Bible uses the idea that we assemble, and when we assemble, we, we are the church. We are the people that God works with and, and does his will and models things to us. Very specifically in Ephesians, when it starts developing the language of what the church is, it has seven different pictures that uh, God wants us to know. And so these, these pictures or these ways that God talks about the church are really important for us to understand because this is how God is relating to us. This is how God has put us on this planet. The picture that we're going to look at today comes to us out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. So let's go ahead and read it. It says, For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers, or foreigners, but fellow citizens and saints, and members of the household of God. Now, here what we have is we have many things actually being told to us from this passage, but it's using the, it's using the idea that before you, were part, you knew God, you were outside of what we call relationship, and they're using the different terms for relationships. You're, you were a stranger, you were a foreigner, you were not a citizen. It would be literally like a, a person that um, is isolated, as though they had no citizenship or no family, but they're saying, now that you're in Christ, you've been brought into this reality. And then it uses the term, you become the household of God. Now, interesting enough, in the New Testament, just to give you an example of this, Christian and believers are really not used that much in the writings of the epistles or even in the gospels, only a, a few references. What, but what is talked about consistently is that you and I are brothers and sisters in a family. And so, so this is how God looks at us. This is how God relates to us. And he wants us to actually begin to recognize this idea that we have been called in this part of Scripture to understand that we are the family of God and why that is so important to the Lord. And it's important for you and I to recognize also. And so what we begin to do is we realize that because we are called the household of God, this represents the idea of family. Now, isn't it amazing if you think about it? Back in the Old Testament, it, could you imagine the people of God, God talks about being a father, but the people of Israel don't catch this. They catch that he's holy. 
and they catch it that he's righteous, and they, that what happens to him is they develop actually a fear of God that's actually not the fear of the Lord, but it was the wrong type of fear. They felt like they needed to stay away from him or that they couldn't approach him because he was so holy, and they were not, that they were going to be consumed by being in his presence. Now you have Jesus showing up on the scene, and he's trying to correct that, and he's saying, now look, the I, yes, God is holy. There's no doubt about that, but we don't want to exalt his holiness and not bring into proper balance the reality that he is a holy father. And since he's a father, we become his family by being in relationship with him. And so what we want to do is we want to develop what, first and foremost what it means to be calling God a father and what that means to be the family of God. So the idea of God being a father has two implications or two ways that we begin to look at it. We have the idea of the vertical reality that God is our father, and then we have what we call the horizontal reality that God is our father. Let's begin to work through this. The vertical reality that God is our father is really startling because he wants to be known that way. In fact, the term father um, really should just be papa. It's an endearing term of an intimate relationship. That's actually the Greek word for God the Father. It's God the Papa, which is fascinating. But when we use that term, we need to understand how we've got to that term in the New Testament based on what we see from the word Father in the Old Testament. The, the Greek word, I'm sorry, the Hebrew word for Father in the Old Testament has two meanings to it. The first one is, is that we recognize God as a Father by being a Creator. So the idea of a Creator God is the idea the term father. He starts something. He brings something into existence. That's what a father does. And we, uh, natural fathers, uh, men who have families, this is part of how they represent God as they bring families into existence. And so the thing that's really interesting about that is that form of fathering is just common, but it's not the complete picture of what a father is. There are a lot of men that can bring forth children, but To enter into the full role of what a father is, we have to move to the second meaning of what father means in the Hebrew language. And this is the word for nurturer. Isn't that fascinating? And so God as a father is a nurturer. In fact, um, when we look at the idea of being a nurturer, a lot of people believe that in marriage, it's the wife's job to nurture, it's the father's job to work and provide, and that kind of thinking or imbalance is not a proper view of how God has created fathers or how he wants families working. I actually believe that the highest role of being a father with my family or in, in, in men in this room, you should hear this, my highest role as a father isn't to represent a provider, but actually represent a nurturer. And that's so foreign in our culture. Uh, We've had generation after generation in our culture where the height of what a father looks like is Spock. Just logical, detached, isn't isn't interactive with the child. Uh, You might go to the game but never talks to the child, never involved what the child's doing, not nurturing him in the things in the Lord. That is not the correct picture biblically. And what, what's happened from that is we've, it's affected, you can actually see the effects of it in the day and age we live in, we literally have a fatherless culture, it's not just the United States, it's actually worldwide, because of this wrong modeling of what a father is, we've had this wrong representation for almost a generation now of um, coldness and frigidness and non-nurturing that men basically look like these objects in families and the family functions outside of the father. In fact, it's so bad that if you observe television or any of those things, father's usually the punchline. He's the guy off to the side. He's this person we make jokes about because the mother and the kids have more intelligence than him. And he's just considered basically a byword. And, And see the confusion? I realized that my role as a father, and I got this from the word of God specifically, was to nurture my wife and to nurture my kids so that they could grow and us as a unit become a healthy and whole family. So it's my job to nurture my family. It's my job to nurture my wife. It's not my job to work and then throw money on the table and say, now everybody just take care of me and let me watch football games all day long. Now, Because we haven't had this picture of God being a nurturer, 
Most people don't understand his approach to them. And so they believe that God wants to relate to them based on rules, regulations. Are you doing everything right? And because of that, there's a coldness that resides in the hearts of men and women when it comes to the idea of God being a father. Next thing is this, is God is a father in a horizontal way. Which means, as God begins to nurture me as a father, because I'm in Christ, as I begin to behold him and he begins to reveal his love to me, it should actually affect me and transfer me to not only being a receiver of love, but a dispenser of the same type of love to other people in the world, and especially the family of God. So when we say God is a father and we begin to talk about this, what I usually do is I get with people and I have conversations with them. And, we, and usually in groups, I ask these, these three questions because I want to see how people understand the reality that God vertically wants to be recognized as a father. And how do we actually relate to him? And so the first question that I always ask a group of people is this, do you and I know how to be loved by God? See, if you remember what I just said, I said that most people are still relating to God in a law-type relationship. And so they believe that talking with God, relating to God, any interaction with God is basically me coming to God and saying, well, yeah, I failed you these 20 ways, please forgive me, and then let me go on and not have relationship with you. And this whole idea of law relating with God as a father causes you to usually just live in the arena of guilt and shame as you approach him. And so when I ask the question, do you know how to be loved? It's a switch because this is actually how the New Testament talks about God. If there's no condemnation over you, Jesus has taken shame upon you. And there's this statement that Jesus actually makes in the New Testament. He goes after us and he says, you know what? The father has left all judgment to the son. So if all judgment is left to the son, how is the father looking at humanity with love? And so when we talk about this idea, do I know how to be loved? We don't ever want to get to the place where we come to God or the father and just relate to him on our behavior. It's actually supposed to go deeper into connecting with a loving God and being nurtured by that. Many years ago now, that's the fun thing about getting older is it keeps, a, uh, time keeps getting greater. 30 years ago, I was living in Cara Springs, going to Bible college. And I, I'm watching, you know, uh, usually go to church on Sunday night back at that point in my life when they used to do Sunday church at night. And um, I, one night I missed it and I decided to turn on Christian television. And so there's this program that comes on that I've never seen before. So it starts with this seagull flying across the air, and then they're coming onto the beach of California, and here's this minister looking up into the sky, and the title of the program is Let God Love You. I thought, well, that's an interesting title for a program. And then the minister starts, then they go into his church, and he starts teaching and preaching. Great, great teacher, awesome teacher in the body of Christ. But as I'm watching that, the Spirit of the Lord started coming upon me. And if, you, if you've ever had the Spirit of the Lord draw near to you, um, a lot of people put it, the Spirit of the Lord in different categories. Well, he's come and he's anointed me. Or he's come and he's given me peace. And we use terms like that to try to describe the tangible presence of the Lord drawing near us. But if we only use God drawing near us in descriptive language and miss the bigger picture, what God actually does by drawing near to us will not have an effect on us. God does draw near to give me peace, and God does draw near with his presence to to anoint me, but the bigger picture is I'm being embraced by God, and he's trying to show me in a very tangible way, I love you. And so I'm watching this program, the presence of the Lord comes on me, and I'm trying to listen to the sermon, and I'm weeping, and as a man, being modeled in our culture that men don't show emotion, that really bugged me. I'm trying to keep myself from weeping, and I want to hear what the program, and so I'm wiping my eyes and blowing my nose and and kidding myself, trying to focus as I'm sobbing through the whole entire program. And then it it finishes, and the presence of the Lord lifts off me, and I thought, what was that? 
So I d decided to do an experiment. The next week I turned it back on, here it started again. Here comes the seagull, the ocean, he's looking up there. We're going into the service now. And as that's happening, the Spirit of the Lord comes on me again. And I'm sobbing. <laughs> and I, I'm making sure that no one's watching me. I, I, my wife's not around because I'm a man. Men don't do this. And th you guys ready? I'm sobbing, and what he's talking about has nothing to do with anything to sob about. He's talking about the values of tithing. <laughs> I'm just, and I'm just, oh, 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 oh. And, and I could have a sense and feel the presence of the Lord, but I have no idea what's going on. So I thought, well, you know what I'll do? I'll actually just do an experiment for the next couple months, and I'll, I'll, I'll secretly watch this and see what happens every time I turn it on. So every time I turned it on, it didn't matter what he was talking about. Seriously. Every time he's, and, and I'm actually trying to like, I am not going to carry on. I'm not going to cry. I know this is something I'm doing. And every time I turn on, poof, here comes the Spirit of the Lord. <laughs> and I spent more time crying those three months. I finally got, I finally decided to figure out what in the world is going on here. Now, when we say, do you know how to let God love you? Most people believe that term means, do I understand that God is a God of love? So the Bible is very straightforward to say, you know, it's not enough for you to conceptually understand that God is a God of love. You have to feel it. You have to experience it. And so as that was happening to me, I started realizing uh, from Scripture and the Lord beginning to speak to me that God was pouring his love on me, but I wasn't opening my heart or understanding it at all. And so I couldn't actually let God love me. Now, if you've been in the same position I have, there's some keys that God can give us to actually begin to respond to it. First, every time the Spirit of the Lord draws near, we need to understand that God is expressing love to us. No matter what the outcome is, the starting point is God is intentionally trying to say, I want you to know I love you. And so anything that's going on from this point on is an expression of love. And our heart actually needs to learn, like Mike was just modeling, we need to stop for a minute, pause, and it's like taking a drink of water. Think of your soul literally like a cup because the Bible uses your soul like a cup a lot of times to explain that when the Spirit of the Lord comes, if you'll just stop, enjoy it, be thankful for it, and cultivate it, it will fill you and satisfy you. Isn't that great? In fact, most of the values of the kingdom, prayer, fasting, silence, solitude, and study, all of those are just so you can recognize the love of God coming near you. And so, are we letting God love us? The second question that I love asking people about this thing about God being a nurturer is, do you know how to respond to love? Now, think about this. The safest place for you and I to be is in the presence of love, especially God's love, right? Why, why is that? Because in the presence of love, any pain, any, any struggle I have in my soul, because love is greater than all of those things, when I stand in the presence of God's nurturing love, whatever is keeping me from having love manifest in my own soul, the Lord loves me past that. Love is actually greater than death. That's what the scripture actually tells us. So you know how powerful death is. The Bible is saying what the greatest enemy or the greatest power that man could ever imagine, the power of death, God is actually saying love is actually more powerful than that. So that actually means that anything that you and I are dealing with, if we let God love us, he can actually overcome that by nurturing us with his love in a very tangible, real way. Number three. When we say that um, we need to let God nurture us, we also need to say, how do you actually let God love you? How do you respond to God's love? And then how do you learn to cultivate what we call a loving relationship? Well, there are a lot of different things that God is after, but the main thing is, is God is trying to help you cultivate and recognize that as he is doing his loving you, he's transforming you in your life. Now, I think one of the best pictures that we have in the Old Testament to this concept comes to us out of Psalms 23. Now, in Psalms 23, we have the shepherding ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ actually being given to us. 
And what's interesting about the shepherding ministry is it talks about the shepherd is among the sheep while they're eating, right? But when he wants them to go to new pasture, he goes ahead of them. Now, when, now how does that have anything to do with a loving relationship, how to cultivate a loving relationship? What God is loving on us in this season of our life, we need to eat of it and stay in it until it does the full work inside our soul. The way God directs us is he goes away from us and he goes to a new pasture of another dimension of the love of God that will satisfy you. But to get you there, he begins to introduce it to you and he makes you long for it so deeply that your soul begins to look for that pasture of love and you're not satisfied until you go there. And most people don't recognize that, so they, they, they think the Lord has abandoned them. And what they do is they become stagnant and almost dead inside themselves because they don't realize that hunger is intentional to go to new and deeper pastures of being in a loving relationship with the Lord. And so here we are today. God actually wants you to recognize his fathering and also the part of being part of his family. You know, the body of Christ or the family of God is amazing, isn't it? Because there's several passages in Ephesians where it starts working through what the body is, and it talks about the body being joints and ligaments. And what's amazing about that, when we talk about the family of God, is you will not experience every way that God wants to make his love available to you until you connect with the family of God. He's decided that the family has a responsibility to reflect love to you also. And so there's a, think about that. Just like when I marry my wife, I don't understand the image of God completely unless I'm in relationship with my wife. I don't understand the love of God completely until I'm in relationship with the body of Christ. There's, a, there's this really weird movement. I don't know if you guys ever observe it, but there's this whole group of Christians that actually think, well, you know, the body of Christ kind of frustrates me, so I'm not going to hang out with them anymore. By the way, the body of Christ frustrates me too. But the reason that is, is because the body of Christ, the family of God, if you've ever watched families, families go through immaturity to come to maturity. That's just the normal progression. And so the body of Christ, the family of God, is in different stages of maturity. We don't, you know, in my own family with my, my wife and my kids, I loved my kids in spite of their immaturity, not because of it. And so when I look at the body of Christ, now remember, these are the people that are called God's family. He loves them intensely, just like he loves you intensely. And he wants us to begin to like, do this thing where we evaluate our hearts. Have you guys ever learned that thing on how to evaluate how much I'm receiving the love of God correctly? Think about this with me. If I'm receiving the love of God correctly, I'll see people the way that God does. If I'm receiving the love of God and it's nurturing me properly, I'll see the family of God and I'll fall in love with them as much as the Lord does, in spite of the immature things they do. I've been given, uh, uh, it humbles me, but I've been given this incredible privilege to actually travel among the body of Christ worldwide. And you guys, Jesus loves everyone in the body of Christ. You know, I think most of the body of Christ, their theology is a mess. That's a joke. That's what teachers always worry about is everyone's theology. You know what? I, I don't have to agree with everybody on everything, but I, that doesn't diminish the command of God for me to love everybody. And I don't want to just be a person that does it because I'm commanded to it. I want God to transform my heart so that when I look at the family of God, they become dear to me because they're dear to him. And they are, by the way. Listen to this. In John 15, 15, it says this, this idea of being the understanding the family of God. Now, Jesus is trying to always work on, look, don't think like law. The whole idea of this term slavery that's going to be used here, this is because people relate to God in law, and so they see themselves this way. So says, I no longer call you slaves, for a slave doesn't know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. 
For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now the word friend here, the reason why I picked this, it doesn't look like a family term, but it actually is. This term for you being a friend, Jesus says, I call you friend. The, the Greek word for it is actually interesting. It's philo. It's where we'd have philosophy. Philo means love. So it should be translated, I believe, I call you beloved. Now think how powerful that is. Each one of us in this room, God calls you. Now think about it. The son was the beloved son of God. Now you're in the son. And that, this term, if it makes sense, the belovedness of that relationship now gets poured on everyone that calls on the name of the Lord. Well, why is that so important? Because the word be beloved doesn't just mean God loves you because he has to. It, mean God, it means that God prefers to be around you because he likes you. So think about the nation of Israel and think about our own life and then think about the church here for a moment. They had gotten into such a bizarre relationship with God that they saw themselves basically as slaves. And Jesus is wanting to destroy that and say, no, don't, don't look at your, this isn't what it means to walk with God, is to be a slave. I'm going to put you in the right category. You're literally the apple or the attention or the thing that my heart literally beats to connect with all the time. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. And when he looks at all of us, he wants to be with all of us the same way. And we need to begin to recognize each other in the same vein. Those people whether they're immature or not, from my perspective, are beloved by God. I need to learn to love them just as much as he does. By the way, also it says that the things he's heard, he will uh, heard from the Father, he will make known to you. That term make known is really interesting because it's the, it's the idea of God, when he comes near you, it means that in heaven there's this reservoir from the heart, heart of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When God comes near you, this making known means that concept of being beloved that the Son experienced, God works it in experiential Christianity. It literally means to be embraced with the experience of the beloved so that you're transformed to be that, not just in word, but in reality. Isn't that amazing? And then the last scripture we're going to look at. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. This is a beautiful passage. It says, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. Now, this is the idea that worship, I, I, know, I know that we, we come and we worship and we sing songs to the Lord, but the Bible actually uses worship as a place of a fa family gathering where you enjoy him, he comes back and enjoys you, and it, it's this really intense, what we call love encounter. A tradition that I actually got out of the Old Testament, I want to share this with you, a tradition that I got out of the Old Testament I've tried to live through in my family. And so when my kids were little, they used to tease each other and, and be hard on each other, and, I, and that was kind of the atmosphere I grew up in. I got kind of sick of it. I thought, well, this isn't the best way for children to relate to each other, and there's always going to be a part of that because you're trying to have fun, but I wanted to establish the expression of love. And so on birthdays, Every time our family gets together, we all go around the table and tell each other the things we love about each other. And when my son-in-law, both my son, I have two son-in-laws now, when both my son-in-laws married into the family, they didn't grow up in that household. And, and I remember watching them struggle with affirming and saying loving words and actually expressing love. And it was I never realized that when you learn to love a person and express it, it opens your heart to a dimension of love that you don't experience until you do it. Now when we get together and we do this, we do it for everyone's birthday, uh, we go around the room and everybody shares, and our family's getting big enough, it takes a long time to do it now. But I don't think there's anything wrong with being affirmed for over an hour and a half because we get put down for a whole entire year. 
And, and watching the, the, my new son-in-laws and my daughters and everybody, you can watch them as we're loving on them verbally, telling them what we think about them, the qualities that are beautiful about them. It nurtures them. I actually can see a building up effect going on in their hearts that actually sustains them for a long period of time. Now think about that. Jesus has called us to be in this place to do that to each other on a weekly basis because he knows if you get that, you're going to be built up and love that you need that comes not only from the Father but from the body will touch you and that will make you whole and healthy as a family. Isn't God's plan for us wonderful? Okay, I need to stop for a minute. Um, sir, what's your name? Tracy. Would you stand, Tracy? Okay, can you just put your hands out like it's Christmas? Here we go. So the Lord wants me to bless you, and so I am going to bless you, just like I described. The Lord has an administrative anointing on you, which is a leadership. And I actually saw you actually reaching out to people and drawing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's, an anoint there's this fire of God's presence and his love that's actually resting on you in a very powerful way because the Lord's going to use you to take people that are hurting in the streets and bring them to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he wanted me to tell you, he's going to so convince you of his love for you, you're going to recognize the tangible favor of the Father resting on you from this season on. And so, Father, get our brother, get your son with your love in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Would you guys, with that, would you guys turn your hearts with me to the Lord and let's engage him? Okay, let's turn our hearts to the Lord. Father, we just thank you that you are our Father and that you call us your children by name. Inside our soul, Lord, where uh, Mike was talking about this and we've been engaging you in and out of this all day, we ask that anywhere that we've not seen our family correctly, would you allow the healing presence of your love to come and work us past holding things against people, and awaken us with a deep love that only can come from your heart for your family. Let us see your family the way that you see them, Lord. Break us, mold us, and shape us into a healthy, whole family. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right, if there's a ministry team here, if you would mind please coming forward, I'm going to give some words of knowledge here. If you have these conditions, you don't have to wait until I get done. If you have this condition and it's you, just stand up and make your way forward, all right? Uh, the Lord was showing me someone had some congestion in their lungs. Uh, it was specifically uh, uh, sitting on the top of their chest, and they're just coughing and having a hard time. If that's you, if you have congestion in your love, uh, lungs, please stand up and come forward. The Lord wants to minister to you. Also, a bladder infection. So if, you've, if you struggle with these or you have these continually or if you have one right now, the Lord actually wants to minister to you. So if that's you, you have a bladder infection, please come forward and receive the healing presence of the Lord. Okay, I guess this, if this is you, please stand, make your way forward. Ringing in the ears. So if you have ringing in your ears or if you have pain in your ear, the Lord actually wants to restore you. So if that's you, please stand up and come forward. The Lord wants to minister to you. And then he was showing me that, um, now a lot of people struggle with back pain, but he was showing me that there's specifically people that the back pain is causing um, literally like an inflammation or like heat or pain to go down the back of their legs. So if you have inflammation, pain, or any of those kind of things going down the back of your legs, the Lord's presence is here to restore you. Please stand up and make your way forward. Now, these were specific words of knowledge that the Lord gave. But if you have a condition that's not one of these, it doesn't mean the Lord doesn't want to heal you. This is what he's starting with. But if you have anything that you need prayer for, please may, uh, stand up and make your way forward. The healing presence of the Lord is here to love on his children and restore you. Now with that, please turn your attention. I'm going to uh, pronounce the blessing of the Father upon you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Mike. Please receive the blessing of the Lord. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn to you and give you shalom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Tell you what, let's stand. We want to just honor what's happening here. So uh, we're going to dismiss in a second here. And uh, But if you do want to receive prayer for anything, if I just want to say, too, if, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this is a great day to begin that relationship. You can come up and see me or someone else on our prayer team or Brian, and we'd love to just walk you through that. So... Uh, Let's just put our hands out one more time and just receive what the Lord has and as we leave this place that, that we carry his presence wherever we go. We carry his goodness. And I just, as we have our hands out, I just want to say too that, that word that he has of just this, that we would begin to consciously and affectionately affirm those around us, that this isn't a just on a birthday uh, celebration that we do it, but that we just make this effort as we, as we encourage the body of Christ, those around us, uh, as, as you just feel something about someone, just encourage them in the Lord. It's, it's an amazing thing, and it will lift people up. And so I just want to encourage you that this is something we begin to do daily, hourly, by the moment. So, Father, right now, I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. Lord, I just ask you for a release, first of all, of your peace I also pray for boldness, Lord, in this season. Lord, that even as we have our hands up, would you, we just receive the boldness of the Holy Spirit right now. Lord, I thank you that we receive your wisdom as well and that we have a new understanding, even from this message and just from this day, of knowing what the body of Christ is and the importance of the body of Christ and the position that we play in the body of Christ. Lord, I thank you that we do receive the love of the Father, and it's in that that we have a greater understanding and knowledge and, and ability to release that love to those in this world, to release that love to the body of Christ and for, to release that love to those that do not know you. And I thank you that we receive a full understanding of your love as we engage with the body of Christ where everyone is using their giftings for the kingdom. And so, Lord, we honor you. We bless you this morning. We thank you that everything we do, whether we eat, drink, what, everything we do, God, we do it for your glory. We do it for the glory of the Father. And it's in Christ's name that we pray.